All right, hello everyone. Welcome to lecture 14. Today's topic is the consistency of distributed databases. Last time we talked about NoSQL databases, but we started off talking in general about data partitioning, which is uh, when we divide da a database's data among multiple nodes so that um, instead of replicating data across lots of nodes, we're, we are giving a, 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 the home, uh, we're splitting up the data among multiple nodes. And that allows us to, when we're reading and writing uh, data, just access one node or a small subset of nodes, a constant subset, um, and to make uh, both reading and writing uh, scalable. And that's, that was the idea behind SQL sharding. Um, I showed how the partitioning of data in a, in a relational database can be treated as a graph partitioning problem, uh, if you to solve that well, where the nodes are the rows and the edges are uh, foreign keys, references where we want to minimize the references that cross between partitions uh, because that makes our implementation, our, our access of the data much more efficient. All right, because generally we're going to have to follow those edges to do joins. And we don't want to do joins across partitions. We want to do the join within a partition. Now, what I was using that, that um, image of, partition, of partitioning a data graph as a way to motivate NoSQL databases because with NoSQL databases, um, what we do is eliminate references, which is to say eliminate all the edges in, the, in that graph, and that makes the partitioning really easy. Um, by eliminating references, what we mean is if you have data that refers to another piece of data, instead of having a, a, a foreign key or a reference to it, you just copy the data you, referred to, you, re, you, you are referring to, and that's called denormalization. Uh, a normalized data model is a relational model where you have foreign keys that, that, that refer to um, other rows in the database, whereas NoSQL doesn't allow that. Instead, it has a denormalized uh, model. Okay, the trade-off here is that we end up consuming more space, and we we have the the same data stored in multiple places where it can become inconsistent. But again, the benefit is that it makes the partitioning of the data really easy, and therefore makes um, scaling much easier. Okay, so distributed NoSQL databases we found last time are very scalable, um, but they they're much simplified compared to SQL databases. You have generally something like a simple key value abstraction. There's only one key that's indexed. So if you want to find data, you need to know um, the key associated with it. You can't, you can't search on any, generally you can't um, quickly find data except using the primary key, one key. And we showed how a distributed hash table can be used to implement a NoSQL database. And um, in that design, you know, we have a hash table where we decide that, divide the hash space evenly among uh, storage nodes. So the client can do a computer hash and then use that to figure out which, which uh, database node to connect to. And that makes it, you know, that, that allows the system to operate without any central bottleneck. There's no one machine that's involved in every interaction. The only limit to scalability here was that all the clients have to have an updated list, an, uh, an up-to-date and accurate list of what are all the database nodes in the system and what hash ranges are they responsible for. Okay, and that's a when, that, when you get to huge sizes, that can become a challenging um, distributed consensus problem. But up to like hundreds or even thousands of nodes, you can uh, implement this kind of NoSQL uh, database based on a distributed hash table in a pretty straightforward way. Okay, So we're going to talk two lectures from now about some of the different variations of NoSQL databases. In this lecture, we're going to talk about um, one of the fundamental challenges that arises in all NoSQL databases, really all distributed databases, which is um, consistency. Okay, and the reason this occurs is because we have to have some replication. Now, here's a, a review of what we, we talked about last time. It's showing it in a different way. We have a distributed hash table where there there's a hash range, a hash space from all zeros to all f's, and the four nodes in the system are assigned each assigned one quarter of the hash range. So and that, and by doing that, they'll be um, storing roughly one quarter of all the data. And when you access, when you want to access data, whether it's a read or write, you'll compute a hash first of the key uh, associated with the data, and then use that to figure out what node you're going to contact. Right. Uh, the, the benefit of this is that it's, but because it's a shared nothing architecture, there's no, um, um, there's no single um, bottleneck, and there, there also is no sharing among nodes. Um, the requests just go to one node, so the it's really scalable. Um, the, both the throughput and the capacity of the system scale up directly with the number of nodes that you add. So if you have n times as many nodes or twice as many nodes, um, then the, the throughput, the throughput uh, 
you know bytes per second you can handle and the capacity both would scale up by that amount n or two depending on what we're talking about and this design can scale up to thousands of nodes okay but what does this design uh, mean for reliability can you stop and think about that for a second what problems might arise regarding reliability here when we scale up our system with a distributed hash table well if you thought about that I hope that you came up with the problem that if you have a lot of nodes that means that your chance of failure becomes high right if you have just a database running on one machine your chance of failure is of like hardware failure or even software failure is based on the reliability of that one machine so maybe you'll have a hardware problem once a year or, or so um, but if you now suddenly have a thousand machines then your chances of failure are a thousand times greater right because on any given day you have not just one machine that could fail but a thousand different machines and so if you're running a database with a thousand machines on any given day like one of the machines is very likely is going to have a problem uh, and you don't want your database to always um, be down because there's always some some one node in it that is experiencing an issue okay so in order to deal with that um, higher degree of uh, likelihood of failure in a bigger system you have to introduce some kind of replication and the simplest way to do this is to just put each storage data in three places let's say okay so we have four nodes but instead of when we compute a hash that tells us which node is is going to be the um, like the main storage location but then we also take the two nodes after it in the in the uh, order and also store the data there so that so I'm using colors to code where the data is stored so I have four different colors corresponding to the four different quarters of the hash space and um, each node ends up storing in this case three over n of the data which is three quarters of the data so the green data is stored here here and here the orange data is stored here here and here by doing this every data is stored in three places every uh, node is responsible for three of the slices of the hash range okay so this is just one what one simple form of replication I'm using this as a model as, as an example because it's uh, it's the simplest to understand and it's it's enough for us to understand some of the challenges that arise once you start replicating data in a distributed database okay Right, and this this bullet, list of bullet points here just shows in this example what parts of the hash range are stored by each of the nodes because each one is storing three quarters because um, the replication level is three and then the denominator four is the number of total nodes in the uh, system. All right, so the problem with that is once you start splitting up your data in multiple places, consistency can be a problem. Okay, and the reason for this we'll see is because there are communication delays. Nothing happens instantaneously in the distributed system. So um, if we want to update data, to write data, so I'm showing here a client that is doing a write. It's storing the value 2 under the key x. So it's storing x equals 2. Um, it has to send that to three different replicas. So I'm showing the three replicas here. And that operation arrives at different times because um, there's no other, I mean, the net networks and computers are not designed in such a way that you can globally synchronize things. There's going to be some a different amount of queuing delay and communication delay and also uh, a different type, you know, set of competing load on each machine that, that would delay a given operation from happening. So um, which which machine processes the write is, is unpredictable if we send if we send the request all at the same time. Okay, so what could happen is if we do the write in three places, it arrives to one machine. It hasn't yet arrived to these other two, and at the same time, um, someone else might do a read, or it could be the same client or a different client. It doesn't matter. Someone else does a read, gets the value of x, um, and it sends. If it tries to read it from three different machines, and accesses those all at, at this moment in time. At this moment in time, the data stored is inconsistent, right? The first one thinks that the value of x should be 2 because it got the update. The other two haven't got that update yet, so they um, have a value of x which is different, which in this case, let's say it's 1. 
Okay, so we did a read of x from three different machines and we got um, two different values. We got a two, we got a one, and we got a one. So the database is somehow inconsistent and that seems like a bad thing that could cause bugs in our system, right? So uh, what's going to happen if we try to read when the replicas are inconsistent? Um, it's hard to, to, to reason about this and to deal with this. So this lecture is going to talk about these kinds of problems and really this is an kind of a light introduction to the field of distributed systems which um, is covered in more detail in the distributed systems class right okay so the fundamental I guess the most important um, theoretical result and research result in distributed systems is called the CAP theorem uh, and you again learn more about this in the distributed systems class and this, and what this theorem says is that it actually proves that for any distributed system, regardless of what software is running and how the hardware is designed and whatever, um, we cannot achieve all three of the following. And and we can actually ignore. You don't have to worry too much about the the definition of distributed system because this theorem really applies to any system, and and the the nature of these bullet points um, are what makes it a di distributed system. Okay. So for any system, you can't you cannot have um, all three of the following which is first a combination of consistency availability and partition tolerance okay so you can only have it, it, the the proof says you can only have two at most two of these at the same time you cannot have all three of them so you can pick two okay so let's look at what these these three different things mean so consistency um, I'm like summarizing this uh, but I think this is fairly accurate consistency means that your reads always get the most recent right or they get an error. In other, words, in other words, you don't get a right. So this is kind of like the previous example sh I gave you showed an example where we, we didn't quite have consistency because we, there was a read that happened after a write but actually didn't get the latest value in some of the cases. Okay, so reads get the most recent write. So if you write and then read, you should, you should read what you just wrote previously. Um, availability is the second property, which is that the system is basically always available, meaning every request receive, receives a response that isn't an error message. Okay, and a third one, importantly, is partition tolerance. Okay, this is this is a most difficult one to understand, but this means that basically you can divide the system and um, have it. You, you, you're you, you're allowed to divide the system like physically, and with that, the way to think about that is that uh, messages between nodes can be either dropped or delayed. Okay, when you, and this is what makes it a distributed system. Um, right in a distributed system generally um, what, what makes it those problems challenging is both the delay the delay in communication between nodes and more, more importantly the possibility for an arbitrary delay in other words the delay is not predictable if you wait let's say one second you can never be sure that that's enough time to receive the response from everyone in the system okay if, if that was enough it wouldn't if there was a time bound on the met the delay of messages between nodes and they were always delivered within a certain amount of time, we wouldn't really call that a distributed system in a theoretical sense. It's because that, that gives us a pretty strong guarantee on the, um, the synchronization between the different elements, right? A distributed system in general has an, allows an arbitrary amount of delay. And you know, in practice, that kind of is true in real systems because um, links can go down, machines can fail. That, that, that unreliability is captured uh, well by this, partition by this partitioning idea. Okay, so taking these three things together, uh, the way I would think about it is that when you have a distributed system, you you have to uh, nodes can get out of sync; they can be partitioned, and when that that happens, if we allow for the the system to be distributed and therefore to get out of sync, we have to accept either that we're going to get inconsistent responses from the different parts of it or we have to wait for some arbitrary amount of time for the nodes to resynchronize. okay? So the waiting um, is a violation of availability, right? And the out of syncness, the partitionness is um, related to, is the partition tolerance, is the partitioning that we talk about in the, in the P part of the theorem. And the um, inconsistency, of course, is, is the lack of consistency. So another, yet another way to put it is that if we build a distributed system where every request immediately gets a response that is globally correct, 
then the only way to do that is to have a network that is 100% reliable and has no delay or, or a bounded delay, I guess is another way to put that. And that is not possible under the partition tolerance assumption. Okay. So that's the CAP theorem, just really quickly. Um, again, we'll be covered more in more detail in the in the distributed systems class, and that's theoretically proven. Now, what we found there is that the CAP theorem gives us a trade-off, tells us that there has to be a trade-off between consistency and delay, essentially. That's how I would simplify it, down to just two things, consistency and delay. Um, so inconsistency is usually more important or, or like inconsistency is usually worse than delay for most implement uh, systems because uh, that can cause weird bugs in your system we're going to talk about in this class about how to trade off between these two but generally we want we as a starting point it, it it's better to maybe avoid incons inconsistency and accept delays uh, in exchange for that um, so usually our applications can handle some kind of delay um, and and that's so that's how we trade these off. But you know if you if you don't like trading off between these three things, the consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. So if you need both consistency and timeliness, you know immediate responses, then you have to go with some kind of a centralized system. In other words, you can't use a distributed system. That's dropping off the P. So if you want CNA, not partition tolerance, then you can you need to use a centralized system, which is um, to say you can use a relational database. That's, that's implemented on one machine, doesn't have any partitioning, you can, ha you can have, you get the benefits of normalized data and all that stuff, as well as have as the consistency and timeliness. Okay. But when we have distributed NoSQL database designs, then um, we have to trade off consistency and delay. And the different databases, like the different implementations, flavors of NoSQL databases have different options for handling this trade-off. Some of them allow you, the, you, you to like configure it differently. Some of them have like just chosen um, one trade-off and we'll see that um, more when we uh, late, later on okay but in this class I want to talk about how um, what those trade-offs are that you can actually make and, and one database in particular uh, that I've worked with Cassandra Cassandra lets you explicitly choose um, the consistency level which is to say to choose uh, how you trade off delay and consistency, which is pretty cool. So the, the really the goal of this class then is to let you, you know, I'm not, if you wanted to really implement a, a, your own NoSQL database from scratch or any kind of distributed database, then you really sh would need more knowledge than in here. You sh should take the distributed systems class. But if you're just choosing from off the shelf uh, NoSQL databases, then I'm hoping to give you enough information to configure that database with a consistency level that is appropriate for your application or to choose among a variety of different NoSQL databases that come with um, like kind of hard-coded consistency models that might be different. Okay, so at this point you can stop and consider in more detail what kind of consistency properties we want we, might, we, we would want to ensure in our system. I think previously I said something about writing reading after the reads after writes should be consistent. Are there any other kinds of consistency you can think of? This is actually a pretty deep question and to answer this really well would take a lot of thought, but maybe you can stop and think about what, what you think consistency might mean. Other ways of expressing consistency in this distributed model uh, for databases. Well, um, in this class, I'm going to talk about three different uh, consistency properties. I'm calling these client centric consistency properties because they have to do with um, what the client sees the database do and that's important because like you as a programmer are going to be sort of implementing the client of a database so it also is like um, these are like software cons con uh, client software centered consistency properties uh, so there I have three of them listed here monotonic reads read your writes and monotonic writes okay so I'm talking about each one of these in a fair amount of detail show examples um, but just to summarize each of them first, monotonic reads is about what happens with two reads in a row that happen from the same on the same client. So if a client reads some some value, the value of x, then later reads this, the value of the same key x. It's the same client making the action. Um, it should the second time around it should get the same value or a more recently written value. 
that includes values that maybe the same client wrote or some other client wrote. But it shouldn't, you shouldn't get an older value, <laughs> I guess, when you read a second time. That's kind of what monotonic reads are saying. Read your writes is another, another one that, that you definitely would want to have. Uh, what this means is that when you write a value to the database and then later read the same uh, key from the database, the value you get should be the same as what you just wrote, what you previously wrote, or it should be a value that someone else wrote more recently or that you wrote, uh, yeah, that someone else wrote more recently than you're right. Okay, so you shouldn't, you shouldn't write to, to X and then read from X and then not see that that write happened, right? So that, that write should, needs to happen before the read. If you, if you wrote, wrote first and then read, the system should recognize that write is happening before read from your observations of it. And finally, monotonic writes mean that if you write twice to a certain key, X, the first write should happen before the second. Okay, that's kind of similar to the, the writes. So you shouldn't, um, it shouldn't be the case that your second write is overwritten by your first write. Okay. So it seems like fairly simple things, but we'll see that actually, um, although these seem like things that shouldn't be a problem because of the distributed nature of the database, if you don't follow certain rules, if you're not careful, these things can be violated. Okay. All right, so let's look at the first one of those, which is monotonic reads. Okay, so I'm showing the client here on the left-hand side as a laptop and distributed database. You know, notice that in these examples, I just throw, show three nodes. I'm showing the three nodes that have the repli replica, that are replicas for this particular key, but the database itself might have more nodes. Okay, but I'm just focusing on the three replicas for this one key, because that's where the consistency issues arise. All right, so the definition of monotonic reads is repeated here. If a client reads the value of X, later reads, later reads of X by that same client will always return the same value of a more recently written value. So how might this fail? So I'm showing an illustration of this happening. So the client is going to issue two reads. These have to go to these three replicas. How, how could these be sent to these replicas in such a way that the second read um, doesn't get, gets an older value than the first read? What do you think? Well, I'll give you first hint. I'll give you is that the reads are could have to be sent to two different nodes. That that makes it more challenging. Okay, so you, what do you think now? If you still don't have it, I'm, the second the thir second hint is that there's a write that happens at the same time, roughly the same time as this these two reads are sent to two different nodes. Okay, so think about how that write could cause the second read to get an older value than the first one does. Well, the issue is when you're, when this write is happening, it has to happen on all three of the replicas. And if we, if the ordering of the effect of that write is chosen badly, <laughs> or is, is a, you know, if we're unlucky in the ordering of the, um, these writes, it could be the case that the, the first thing that happens in our system is that this write is stored on the first node and maybe the second node it hasn't quite reached the third node yet. Okay, so we have an inconsistent state for this variable. That's the first thing we need. We, we need inconsistency. Or it's always going to be in inconsistency for some amount of time when there's a write. Okay, so then we're showing here, we're, we're kind of zooming in on the time frame when there's inconsistent data in under this key x, right? Because the, the write hasn't reached the third node. Now, if the client at that during that inconsistent time frame, it does a read from these two different nodes, and, and the first one that it does is to the one that was updated, one of the ones that was updated, and the second one is to one of the ones that was not updated. Even though the client actually issued these in the order, you know, one two, um, those are are hitting the 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 timing is such that the second one, even though it was issued after the first read, it reaches a node that's like pretty well, out, pretty significantly out of date, and therefore it gets uh, the old value. Okay, so that, that's how it fails. Now, how would you prevent this problem? Are there any kind of rules that you could put in place for the reads and writes that would prevent this from happening? Prevent to ensure monotonic reads uh, for this client? How could you avoid some of these issues? Well, uh, the first idea might be to make 
your client connect to the same node for every request. So if you're reading X, if this second request was sent to the first node, then it would then then it would have gotten the same data that the first one did. Or it could have gotten a later data, but it could never have gotten an earlier data, an earlier version of the data. And that that same logic applies regardless of which one of these nodes we happen to send those two requests to. Like for example, if both of these requests were both sent to the to the lower node, then they both would have gotten the old value, and that's okay. Okay, because that, that's consistent. Even though it's out of date compared to this right over here, it's consistent. It's consistent from the client's perspective. The client is just seeing a slightly older view of the system than someone else might be seeing in a different location. All right, so with these distributed systems, you have to think about kind of time and space. Once you introduce space, you introduce delays. So there's no one state of the system. There's only like a, a, a set of distributed state where information always takes time to travel. And another option here, if you're really insistent on making your second request to this third node, that could have been acceptable if you waited long enough. In other words, if you waited for this third write to arrive before you made this, before you allowed this read to proceed, that would have been also been sufficient. So there actually are two solutions to this problem. Okay, and we'll come back to uh, to defining more formally how we we might solve these problems. Okay, the second consistency property that I wanted to ensure was reading your writes. Remember the definition of reading your writes is that when you a client writes a value, so I'm showing a put x equals 1, and then later that same client reads a that value, it should get the same value or a more recently written value. It should not get the value that was stored before this write happened. Okay, How can this now fail uh, in, in a distributed system? Stop and think about that. Well, um, the, this can fail if, for, I mean, it's kind of similar to the last one where we, we do a write and that write is not fully propagated to this third node uh, and we decide to read from the third node instead of reading from the location where the data has already been stored. All right, so we somehow read too quickly from this node here. And we, we like, so we made the same two mistakes <laughs> that we, we, we made last time. We read from we we acted on two different nodes of the system. Uh, one client acted in two different places, and also the second action happened too quickly, right? If we either delay the second one, or we did the operations on the same node, we would have prevented this, right? Stick with one node or slow down. Those are the two solutions to this problem. Uh, so the third property we have is monotonic writes, which is that if you write twice. To the same value, we want the second write to happen before the first. No, we want the first write to happen before the second. <laughs> okay. So here I'm showing the client doing two writes: write value x equals one, then write value x equals two. How can this fail? How can it be that at the end of this operation, we're still we're storing x equals one instead of storing x equals two? That's essentially the, how this would fail. That's a, a, a signal that this has failed. So how how would that happen? Pause and think about that. Well, you know, again, you operate on two different nodes and operate too quickly. So um, you send the first request to, to one node. The second request, we send it pretty quickly to another node. And that write happens here. So we might write the value 2 here. But then by the time this value, this write of 1 might eventually propagate to this third node in such a way that it overwrites what was written here. Okay, I'm showing uh, I'm showing the databases, the replicas themselves doing the propagation in this example, whereas in the first example I showed the clients doing the propagation themselves. It could be, you know, uh, either the arrows could be coming from this client as well, um, and the effect would be the same. Yep. So the second write can can occur on a node before the first arrives, and then the first one arrives later and overwrites it. That's the problem. Now, you might ask, does this matter in the long run that this that there's this earlier write that is in transit to this node? Is it is it a problem that this last node here got the new data first before getting the old data? Well, it kind of depends on how you implement this. If you were just if you just implemented it very naively, it would be a problem because you would you would overwrite 
But if you, um, or if the operations are, are somehow some kind of cumulative thing, like an, uh, yeah, well, depending on what the operation is, it might not matter. Like if it's just an increment, it doesn't matter if the increment comes in uh, this one first and then that one or that one and then that one. But the, the way you can have, you can make this make this problem less uh, of an issue is by having timestamps on your requests, uh, which we, we either call them timestamps or sequence numbers. So if the if this request if the client adds a clock value, a sequence number, a timestamp, whatever you want to call it, to these requests, and says, okay, my operation number one is setting x equals two, and my operation number two is setting x equals two. I'm sorry, those numbers are confusing because they're the same as the values, but you get the idea. Then when this when this earlier one propagates down here, it can get rejected by this replica because it would reckon it would it would know that the value currently stored is two. It also know that the timestamp of that value is newer than the timestamp of this other value that's arriving here. Okay, so often these distributed databases have um, for the keys the, uh, they have not just a value but also a timestamp for when the value was generated in order to avoid um, a delayed write from from updating a newer value. But you know, time is not gonna be globally synchronized across all your clients. So it, that generally only works for the operations that were generated by the same client because the, the clock here is gonna be self-consistent but someone else's clock might be slightly off from mine. There's no way for you to really control that in the distributed system. And the solution is the same as before in the sense that you can operate on the same node or you can delay the second one sufficiently to prevent it from happening, to prevent um, the second write from happening before the first one. Okay. So we saw, to review that, we had generally two alternatives for achieving consistency um, at the level that we're describing here. Um, we can... Um, which is, th this level of consistency is, I think, called eventual consistency in, in most uh, models, if I'm not mistaken. There are, um, the first approach is to make the client send all the requests to the same replica node each time, which is a simple approach. Uh, but the downside is that it, that's not a very reliable approach, because that node, if that node fails, and remember, the reason we had cons we had replicas was to allow a node to fail, but for the data not to be lost, and for the system to continue operating. So when a node fails, and you're you were tied to making requests to that node, you have to switch to another node. And at that point, you uh, the cons all the consistency problems we were talking about are now po possible again because our, our previous request happened to another a different node. Now we're on it. Now we switch to another one. Okay, so these kinds of bugs, incidentally, are, can be difficult to track down because they only would happen infrequently, which is why you need to think <coughs> carefully about like the theory of, of uh, consistency when implementing this kind of a system. Otherwise, you'll have some subtle bugs that come up. Now, if you don't care about fault tolerance, then um, you can avoid replication and get consistency. I mean, the whole motivation for this lecture at the beginning was we introduced replication, therefore we have consistency problems. But keep in mind that you don't need to have that replication. If you're willing to take to... Um, the CAP theorem actually still covers that case in the sense that when we drop redundant, when we drop a replication, we no longer have availability. So if a machine fails, we're, we're kind of offline for a while. Um, so MongoDB doesn't replicate data, um, at least by default. And therefore, it has uh, has consistency, it has partition tolerance, but it doesn't have availability. Because if one node goes down, then all the data that is, was associated to, with that node is unavailable to the system until you can somehow restore it from a backup or reboot it or whatever. Hopefully, you have some kind of a backup. All right, so that, the first approach, like I said, was to make all the requests happen for a single client, have all of its requests go to one of the replica nodes, even though there are many available. Okay. Now, different clients can make different choices, but as long as each individual client sends their requests to one replica node, we'll have that client-centric consistency that, we're, that, we're looking, that we defined. Okay. The second approach is to make the client wait until the read or write that it did is synchronized across the whole system. Okay, so it's either... And the benefit here is that you still allow the client to be operating with more than one node so that it can, it can, it can follow this scheme even in the presence of failures. Uh, but, you know, again, it has to wait 
until some level of synchronization happens across the system. We'll talk about what that means in the next couple slides. Um, now, we're t when we talk about synchronization, we're talking about the one operation. We're doing either a put or a get of a, uh, a key. So just for that one operation, that's the level of synchronization we're talking about. So like you're writing a value, wait until that write finishes and is consistent across the system, whatever that means. We'll talk about that later before you proceed to your next database operation. Okay, so the question though is how do we know when the value is synchronized? So what do you think? Pause and think about that. Well, um, one approach you might come up with is for the client to send the request to all the nodes and wait for all the nodes to acknowledge it. Right? That's kind of that was one of the examples I think I showed earlier. So if we're talking about ensuring monotonic reads, we have two reads that, that the client is doing, right? So the first read involves reading from have the client read to all three nodes, right? And wait until all three nodes return the same value before you proceed to the second read. And in the meantime, you know, someone else could be doing a write that puts the nodes in an inconsistent state. But as long as you wait until you get the same value, and that, maybe that involves a retry or something, we're not going to go into details of that. Um, but if you wait until you get the same value from this third node, and then you have all three you have three of the same values from the three nodes, then that means that you can that the the uh, you read during an inconsistent during a consistent state, and so you can move on to the next read. Okay, and so that will will enforce some kind of delay between the operations, so that you're not essentially you're not you're you're making sure that you're not reading during a state when the three nodes are inconsistent. Applying the same waiting idea to the read your write. Uh, property. In this case, we're writing first and then reading, right? We want to make sure that when we read after our write, we get the data we wrote. If when we write, we wait until all three of these nodes acknowledge that, that they've accepted the data, so we wait for a response. Once we get all three responses, we move on. At that point, the client is sure that the full system has accepted that, that update, and then there's, it's not possible that any of these reads afterwards would get an, an, an older value than what was uh, written before. Right, regardless of who you send it to. Okay, so when we are using this idea of waiting for consistency uh, with with this kind of distributed database, um, the the general way to think about this, and that is, and the thing that's configurable in databases like Cassandra, is the uh, we, it's called consistency level, um, and the way the way this is um, controlled is with different levels of quorum. That's the the term used for uh, the number of nodes that you have to uh, get a response from before you can proceed. So quorum is a general word in like uh, government and, and like political bodies for the minimum percentage of a committee that you need in order to act. Okay, And this is a set of solutions. You, you can have different levels of quorum, but they have to be balanced in such a way to make the system consistent. So you're, you're waiting for an acknowledgement of consistent data from a certain number of replicas before considering that read or write to be completed. And when you're waiting, you're preventing progress until the replicas have reached a certain degree of consistency. So the three different levels I want to talk about here are, are, are ba balancing between the reads and the writes, actually. So you could, in, you could in the uh, most conservative case, require everyone to acknowledge all your writes and all your reads before you proceed. But that's not strictly necessary. Remember, in the in the case here where we are writing to all three nodes, if we're waiting for all three to acknowledge the write, then the read actually doesn't have to access all three. It can access any one of them and be sure that um, it'll it, it'll get the the write that happened previously, right? So, and we can also do the reverse. It turns out we can write to just one of we can proceed with our write after just one of them acknowledges if our our read waits for all three to be consistent before it proceeds. Okay, so so the the options are, um, yeah, the most important options I would say, are that the, these three, right? You can require that the writes happen on all the nodes before you proceed, and then that allows your reads to happen after just one um, acknowledges. And this so this this makes your writes kind of slow, but your reads fast. On the other side, you can have the write be acknowledged by just one node before proceeding, and, but your reads have to wait for all of them to be consistent before you proceed. That leads to fast writes, but slow reads. Okay, And then in the middle, there's a, tr a, a trade-off uh, called majority quorum, 
where let's say you have three replicas. When you write, you wait for two of the three to acknowledge before you proceed. And when you read, you wait for two of the three to, to acknowledge before you proceed. And this balances read-write performance and also allows for um, a node to fail without stopping your reads or your writes. Okay, so, that, so actually this, this majority quorum choice is a pretty good one to consider and, uh, in practice. Okay. All right, so let's look at, at majority uh, reading, majority writing quorum uh, in more detail. Again, we're assuming we have three nodes. So we want to write the value x equals 1. We send that write request to, to three replicas. Okay. What, that mean, what the meaning of this majority uh, quorum idea is that we, we have to wait until we get an acknowledgment from two of those three before we can proceed. That, that third write is still going to proceed in the background. We're not going to, like, we're not going to write to only two. We're still going to write to all three of them, but we will wait to proceed to the next database operation until we get an acknowledgment from the two out, of, two out of the three, so that our next operation, whether it's a read or write, will not be operating on a version of the system that looks like it, it was before the write happened, basically, right? So if later on we do a read of that same value, we send three read requ requests to three replicas. Um, so at this point, because we only are doing majority, using a majority quorum instead of uh, like an all quorum, one of the replicas could still have old data at that point, but that's okay because we're waiting to get two um, responses that are, that are the same before we proceed. So uh, yeah, and, and if we get two different responses, we can use the most recent one because we we know that um, that it's not possible we have two old it's not possible we have two old values for x because we waited for at least two of them because two is more than a majority and we waited for, for a majority to accept the response before we proceeded okay notice again that we're relying on timestamps uh, stored in the database for the for the data elements to figure out which one of the two is the most recent okay Right, so because the writes are not finished until at least to acknowledge, there's at most one old value being stored, and at least one of the two must be new. So at any given time, uh, yeah, we can, if there are two nodes that say the same thing, that represents a, a state of the system that's, that's, uh, that, was, that was valid at some point. And from this one client's perspective, uh, it's, uh, things appear in the right order by following these rules. We also can apply a different rule, uh, single read, unanimous write is another more common choice. So this makes the reads fast, but the writes slow. So it, um, all three of the replicas have to acknowledge the write before we proceed. So we want to write a value of, of x equals one. We, we send it to all three. We wait for those three to acknowledge before proceeding. So this is this is okay um, if uh, writes are uncommon, and that's kind of a, 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 a fairly typical situation in a, a computer system if reads are more common than writes. When you want to do a read, you send, you actually, even though you're only need, you only need a single one to respond, you still might send it to all three replicas so that you can um, proceed when any one of them gives a response. So you can, you, the performance is like, the latency is the minimum of the latency of the three that you accessed, right? Um, or you could choose to send it to just one. If you, if you don't want to impose as much load on your system, you have that choice. Uh, but there's a possibility that um, you get better performance by sending three in parallel. Okay, so the responses you get from the three nodes could be different, but but that that would only be due to partial writes from other clients, not par not an incomplete write from yourself. So notice that there's still inconsistency in this. The, the database state is still going to be inconsistent at different times. Like if you had this magical global view of what is being stored in different places, but the client from a client's from the client-centric perspective, that inconsistency to see that happens while you're following these rules is not a problem. The only inconsistency that could be there is due to a partial write from some other client, not from you. If it was your own write, you would have waited for all three of them to finish before proceeding. But if someone else, someone else might be in the middle of their write, in which case you can actually just choose one. You can choose one value or the, or the other. It doesn't matter. Um, it, it, that's just a difference between you're seeing the ver a version of the system an earlier or slightly later version of the system uh, before or after that other person took their action. And in a distributed system in general, that should it should be okay to have uh, 
you know, we're not requiring that you read others' rights. Remember, we just had those simple three sets of consistency rules, read my rights, uh, monotonic reads, and monotonic writes. Okay. So the writes are slow, but the reads are fast. You have to, the writes are bound by the, you have to get a response from all three, so the maximum latency of the three will determine the, the overall latency. Okay. I think the final topic I want to cover here is thinking about what happens when a failure occurs under this consistency uh, model. Okay. So this first example has a read and write quorum of two, so majority quorum. We have three replicas. Uh, let's say we do a write of x equals two. It goes to two nodes, and that means we can proceed. The client can proceed to its next database operation. This third write is still going to be uh, executed eventually. Uh, so that's in flight. But at this point, one of the nodes fails. Okay, so this this first node fails. Third write hasn't happened yet. So now we have two nodes, two replicas storing the data. They have two different values. Can reads and writes proceed in this situation under majority quorum? What do you think? Um, well, you, you you can read you can try reading from these two from all the nodes. Well, you you won't get a response from the failed one because it's failed. You'll get a response from these two that might that would have two different values. Um, but uh, if they have timestamps on them, you can choose the most recent one and proceed. So that's not a problem. And uh, keep in mind that this third this failed node will eventually be replaced by a a replacement, and it can get the uh, the data st formally stored on here from the replicas based on you know the, the hash partitioning rule that you have um, and that will make it available to the rest of it of uh, the system and you also can do writes because you know you can do those writes on these two nodes here the only problem now though is that you cannot tolerate a, a further failure of the system after you've lost one right if you're, you're using majority reads and writes and there are only two of three replicas available you can still proceed as long as both of these nodes, but you'll have to wait for both of them to give a response. So it essentially turns into a situation where you're using a, a quorum level of all read and all write temporarily while this third node is offline. Okay, so the, the second example, failure example, is with a different uh, consistency level. We ha we're assuming a write quorum of three and a read quorum of one. In this case, a replica fails while we're in the middle of writing, and the write, write has, has finished on the first two nodes, but it never gets to this third one because it failed. Right? There's no one here to receive the third uh, write. At this point, what happens to reads and writes? Can reads proceed and can writes proceed? Well, um, you can try to write to three, but you won't get an acknowledgment from three, so actually you'll not be able to write to three, but reads will... Um, be able to proceed. So, so part of the system is stalled temporarily. The part of the system that is stalled is writes to the the hash range. The hash range is covered by this failed node. If you're writing to other parts of this of the hash range that are handled by three different replicas, all of which are available, then those can proceed. But part of the system will be stalled temporarily until this item this node is replaced. Okay, that's one of the reasons why overall the majority quorum is a can be a better choice, although again the read performance is not quite as good. Okay, you can retry the write later um, after a, a replacement joins uh, for this. Okay, now I want to remind you all: just because I've been showing three nodes in these diagrams, that doesn't mean that there are only three nodes in the system. And generally, there wouldn't be just three. Like if you're the the examples I showed involved often making. Uh, updates like making writes doing writes to all the nodes in the system that's not really what's happening i was just showing three the three replicas on in a bigger system so you should think about the system as a big distributed database with lots of nodes for any given key you hash it to figure out which three replicas which three nodes store the um store that data replicas of the data but it's going to be just three out of n and you do your reads and writes to those three you know within those three, you know, you could be using a majority, you know, two out of three for the reads and writes before you proceed, but eventually the operations are happening on all three. A different key would map to, uh, in general, a different hash range, and therefore would be three different nodes, okay? So 
uh, in, in, in this, the terminology I'm using for quorum, when I say write to all, I don't mean all the nodes, I mean all the nodes, um, all the replicas for that key. Okay, so you're never going to do a write to all these nodes in the database. There's no one write operation that would affect all the nodes. That would be an unscalable design. Rather, um, but you know, you might it might it would involve all the replicas for that uh, data, which would be a constant, often three, could be five, something like that. Okay, hope that makes sense. Yeah. So uh, actually, you can think now. Why are there any situations in which you'd want to use more than three replicas? And so like five instead of three or four. Well, um, having more replicas means you have more fault tolerance. So remember, I, I, I mentioned that when you have three nodes and one of them fails, you cannot tolerate the failure of another one without stalling your system. So if you wanted to tolerate two failures, no, failure of two nodes, which are sharing the same hash range, then um, which are replicating the same hash range, then you need to have more than Three replicas. That's an example. Okay. But having five copies of data is like really pretty inefficient, right? So you might not want to do that. Now, okay, actually, there's one final topic. Uh, briefly, there are other ways of looking at consistency besides these three client centric properties that I gave. Uh, another one that's kind of cool and pretty easy to understand is called linearizability. Okay, linearizability uh, ensures that partial ordering of distributed actions is preserved. What does that mean? So we have a, a distributed system means we have a bunch of distributed actors, machines in different places. Um, they each know the order of their own actions, right? That, that certain knowledge shouldn't be contradicted by the distributed system ever at any point in the system. That, that, so that's the key thing that linearizability ensures. So the the distributed actors observations of their own actions creates a partial ordering that should be obeyed anywhere throughout the system okay so uh, i'll show what that means later on with some examples so basically if you have two people let's say that are involved in the distributed system they each do three things so so anita does a b c in that order and sam does s t u then those are happening concurrently in three different locations, and the information about those events has to travel throughout a distributed system. We don't know how quickly it'll travel in general, and that the different paths can, can have different speeds that change over time. Okay, so in different locations in the system, this big system involving lots of people, you'll see those actions in a variety of different orders. And those different orders are called serializations. So at, at any one location, all the events across the whole system are viewed in some order. That's called the serialization of the activity. There's going to be different serializations in different locations because information, er, the actions originate from different locations and they propagate in different with different speeds. Okay, so we'll have different serial the actions of the global system will have different serializations at different positions, but every one of those serializations must be agreeable to the individual actors in the sense that it doesn't violate their own view of their own actions, which they know for sure to be correct. So Al Anita d knows that she did B after A. No one in the whole world sh should observe A before B. Okay, because Anita knows A happened before B because Anita generated those events. Okay, so I'm showing here three examples of different serializations which are all valid, but they're all different. They're all valid because they have a, B, a before B and B before C and A before C, S before T, S before U. So this one puts all of Anita's actions first and then all of uh, Sam's actions. This might be what Anita observes at her location, for example, because it takes a long time for, for Sam's actions to travel to her. Somewhere in the middle of the system, you might have a mixture of the two actions, right? You have S, A, B, T, U, C. Okay, so one of Sam's actions, two of Anita's actions, another one of Sam's actions, another one of Sam's, and finally one of Anita's actions. This is still this is valid though, even though it's a different serialization than what Anita, Anita saw. It's still valid from Anita's perspective because all Anita knows for sure is that she did A before B, and she did B before C, and she did A before B, A before C, and that's still true in this other observation. Okay, so that serialization is still valid, and Stu also would agree with this, right? Because Stu knows that 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 he did S, then T, then U, 
And then, you know, same thing. This is another serialization here. The other extreme is maybe at uh, Sam's location. He sees his own actions first, and then it takes a while for Anita's to arrive. Um, these are all valid serializations from the perspective of both of these participants. But, you know, you could generate an invalid one very easily by just reordering any of these letters within these three groups. Okay, so that's called linearizability. And linearizability is a form of um, consistency. So, so the, the three properties we talked about, monotonic reads, monotonic writes, and reader writes, are actually a subset of linearizability. So linearizability ensures those three properties. It also ensures some other things. And consist there are many different consistency models <laughs> um, that are used uh, in different uh, theoretical discussions of distributed systems and that are implemented in different practical systems. Okay, so I, you know, we're not going to go into details of all this stuff. Just a distributed systems class would talk about it more, and research in distributed systems would go into even more detail and all these things you're seeing here. Okay, so there are many different consistency models. Um, I think it's a fascinating topic because it mixes uh, CS theory and mathematical proofs with um, real system designs, and 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 it's applicable to real systems, right? So to learn more about this, there's a distributed systems class. Chapter 7 of uh, this distributed systems book, uh, which I think is available online, uh, covers it. Part 2, Chapter 9, in particular, of the Dis Designing Data Intensive Applications book by Kleppman covers it uh, very well. And um, yeah, this book covers the data-centric view of consistency, um, I think, as well as the client-centric view. So yeah, there's a lot more to consistency than just this, but I wanted to give you, like I said, enough for you to, to make choices about distributed which NoSQL database to use and how to configure that distributed database and when you're writing software what issues you might encounter in the software depending on on what consistency model your database implements okay so just a final this is kind of a review because I think I already said this to some extent but NoSQL databases um, there are many different ones like so examples are DynamoDB, Cassandra, Elasticsearch, MongoDB uh, it depends on how you implement MongoDB, but like the hashed sharding option in MongoDB is is, is uh, implemented by a distributed hash table. These other ones are distributed hash tables. It's a very common basis for for NoSQL d distributed databases because of the simplicity of of deciding where to distribute data and and how to find data. In addition to databases, distributed file systems also can use distributed hash tables. If you just think of the file name path as the key and the value as the file's full contents. Okay, so a big blob of data that is the file. So examples of distributed file systems uh, would be like Hadoop, HDFS, Google File System, um, or Colossus or Bigtable are kind of like the predecessors to that or variations. And Amazon's S3, which you um, would use in the projects for this class. All right, so all of these store files in a lot of, a lot of machines and the way that you determine which file is storing your data um, typically or uh, would be through a distributed hash table. Okay, so today we talked about distributed hash table, distributed database consistency um, and the reason we had to worry so much about consistency was because we wanted our data to be available even when there was a failure of a node. We had If we had the bit, database is huge there are going to be frequent failures therefore we need to have replication of data. Okay. And when you have data living in two places, you can't write to it or you can't have a, an update immediately effective in all the locations. You have to have some sol solution for the consistency of the data. The CAP theorem said that we needed to trade off between uh, consistency and availability and partition tolerance. So uh, the degree of separation of separability of the nodes, in other words, the distributed nature of the system, which usually we can't control, um, is... is at odds with having consistency and availability. Okay, so with a, we talked about a few different consistency properties we wanted a distributed database client to have: monotonic reads, monotonic writes, reader writes. Altogether, those are a subset of linear what's called linearizability. And the solutions we had for this involved um, waiting for consistency. So we wait uh, until we get responses from more than one using certain rules. Um, which we call quorum levels. We either wait for all the nodes, to, the replicas to respond, for a majority to respond, or for one of them to respond. And um, we can mix these up with 
the reads or writes. We could have, use majority for everything, or we can have all for reads, one for writes, or all for writes, one for reads. Okay. And what what choice you make here depends. It gives you a trade-off in the performance of reads and writes, and also the level of availability of reads and writes during failures. Okay. In particular, Cassandra is a NoSQL database that lets you, as the programmer, um, choose the quorum level you want for each read and write. And you actually can have different quorum levels for different operations on the same database, which can be confusing and lead to errors <laughs> if you're not careful. Um, and other other NoSQL databases uh, often are designed, to, like kind of hard coded, to use just one of these read write consistency strategies so um, you know again knowing about this allows you to choose between among databases and also to configure databases uh, that you might be using for a scalable system all right hope that made sense thanks and see you later